In the aftermath of Alexander the Great's death, his empire fractured into competing states, and his generals, the new kings of the Hellenistic period, launched a series of bloody wars for control of that empire, or at least a piece of it. To aid them in these conflicts, engineers and architects were deployed to construct ancient mega-weapons, and the sheer size of these devices and the fear they inspired has cast a long shadow on the pages of military history. In 305 BC, the city of Rhodes came under attack by the forces of Demetrius I of Macedon, known to posterity as Demetrius the Besieger of Cities. The son of Antigonus the One-Eyed, Demetrius was a member of the Antigonid dynasty, one of the successor houses claiming a portion of Alexander's empire. His great rival was Ptolemy I, another of Alexander's generals and the founder of the Ptolemaic kingdom centered on Egypt. While Rhodes was technically on amicable terms with most of the new states, they had a more direct relationship with Egypt, and because of that, Demetrius became concerned that the city would give his enemy ships, or possibly allow troops to be stationed there for an attack on Antigonid lands. After initially breaching the walls and then being forced to retreat, Demetrius tried a different approach to take the now-repaired walls of Rhodes. A massive siege tower, the Helepolis, the city-taker, was constructed in order to help his soldiers in this task. Siege towers had been used in war since at least the Bronze Age, but the Helepolis was a different beast entirely, and it's our first Hellenistic mega-weapon. The siege tower stood approximately 40 meters high and was 20 meters wide. Armor plated on three sides, the Helepolis weighed about 150 metric tons, and it was attached to a frame housing eight 5-meter wheels and a series of casters, so it could be moved in any direction required by the army. Within the siege engine, 200 men broke their backs turning a capstan which turned a system of belt and pulleys to move the wheels, and 3,400 men worked in shifts pushing the Helepolis from behind. Rising up from the base of the tower were two staircases, one for ascending and one for descending, which ran through several decks containing 16 catapults and four ballista for assaulting the city walls. The city taker, however, did not live up to its name, although it very nearly did. There are primarily two accounts of why it failed. One says that the Rhodians dug a wide trench in the path of the Helepolis under the cover of night, and the next day, the siege engine got stuck in the mud and had to be abandoned. The other says that as it was advancing towards the walls, several of the armor plates were knocked loose, and Demetrius ordered the Helepolis back behind the lines to avoid it catching fire and burning down. Either way, the siege ultimately failed, and the Rhodians melted down the iron plating and weapons from the Helepolis and used the funds to construct the Colossus of Rhodes. The Hellenistic period is often termed the Age of the Super Navies, and with good reason. The biggest ship probably constructed in antiquity was the Tesserocanteres, built for Ptolemy IV, otherwise known as the Forty, for the amount of rowers required on each column of oars. The size of the ship is disputed. We have several texts from the Hellenistic period attesting the ship, so we don't necessarily have any reason to doubt that this was real, but given that it was constructed of wood, it's possible that the specifications are exaggerated. The famous Nemi ships, built by the Roman Emperor Caligula, were about 73 meters in length. We know that giant ships like this were constructed in the ancient world, but this one was slightly less than double the length of the Nemi ships according to the surviving sources, about 130 meters. This was probably constructed by building a deck between two parallel ships of equal size, and the sheer magnitude of this super ship has been called into question since at least the 19th century. The sources tell us it had a beam of about 17 meters per hull, and the length of the rowing oars was 17 meters and the steering oars were 14 meters. It held 2,800 marines and 4,000 oarsmen and 400 deckhands, and it was equipped with seven bronze rams and catapults mounted on the deck. The problem, however, is that we don't exactly know what the ship looked like. So if the dual galley idea is the correct interpretation, because it's two ships connected by a deck, something of this size would not necessarily be able to handle the waves of the Mediterranean, 
unless it was maybe reinforced by metal, which the surviving sources don't mention. The oars are another problem as well. It's stated that the ship had 4,000 oarsmen, and at one point it was believed to have 40 tiers of oars, which would mean something like 10 men per oar, but the size of the bigger oars would not be able to be moved by 10 men. This is something very well attested during later periods when galleys were still employed. So perhaps instead the textual description is exaggerated. It could very well have had 4,000 oarsmen, but it's thought now that this perhaps means three tiers of oars with 2,000 men on each side, 40 men per oar. Plutarch does note that this ship was so big that it was difficult to turn efficiently, and thus was more of a showpiece for the Egyptians than an actual weapon. Even if that was the case and this was simply a showpiece and not actually used in combat, the ability to construct something this massive highlighted the strength and power of Hellenistic Egypt, and it would certainly have struck fear into the hearts of their enemies. But how did such a gigantic ship make it into the water in the first place? For this, the Egyptians devised an ingenious method for the ancient world up to that time dry dock construction. The original source for this is Calixenus, a late 3rd century BC writer from Rhodes, who wrote a four-volume work titled Peri Alexandrius. This is the main account for the Tesseract and Teres, and although it's now lost, fragments of it survive in later sources, mainly from the Roman period. And concerning the dry dock, Calixenus states the following. A Phoenician devised a new method of launching it, having dug a trench under it, equal to the ship itself in length, which he dug close to the harbor. And in the trench he built props of solid stone five cubits deep, and across them he laid beams crosswise, running the whole width of the trench, at four cubits distance from one another, and then making a channel from the sea he filled all the space which he had excavated with water, out of which he easily brought the ship by the aid of whatever men happened to be at hand. Then, closing the entrance which had been originally made, he drained the water off again by means of engines, and when this had been done, the vessel rested securely on the before-mentioned crossbeams. However, despite such a massive ship having been built, the sources are unfortunately silent on its fate. Our next Hellenistic mega-weapon is a similar type of super ship, the Leontophoros, or Lion Bearer, whose dimensions, like the Tesseract and Teres, are likewise disputed. It was built for Lysimachos, another of Alexander's generals, and after Alexander's death, and after Alexander's death, one of the successor kings competing for control of his empire. This is actually the first of our Hellenistic superships chronologically, and our main source of information for it comes, like so much else from this period, from a later text, in this case written in the 9th century, quoting a fragment of a history of the city of Heraclea, written by a man named Memnon in the 1st or 2nd century. The quoted text is, however, abbreviated and shortened in the surviving 9th century work, so the size of this ship and its function is not entirely certain. We don't know if this was a single long ship that was impressively wide, or if it was two galleys joined by a deck in the manner that the Tesseract and is thought to have been. Our information on this ship is, unfortunately, extremely sparse, even taking the standards of ancient history into account. Probably the best guess for this mega-weapon is as follows. It's not certain when the Leontophoros was constructed, sometime between 305 and 290 BC, but this likely was not a ship designed to be used for a boarding platform or anything of that nature. The Leontophoros did take part in battles, but the best estimates for the size of the ship, something like 100 meters in length and 10 meters wide, with maybe 1,200 to 1,600 oarsmen and 1,200 marines, means that it was slow. Memnon tells us that the ship had to be protected by firing arrows and javelins, but also states that there were catapults on the platform as well. This has been interpreted to mean that rather than a large ship designed to crush smaller ones or function as a boarding platform to send marines onto other ships, the Leontophoros was actually a mobile siege platform designed to approach an enemy harbor or coastal wall and bring down the fortifications with its artillery. Unlike the Tesseract and Teres, we do seem to know what became of the Leontophoros. Lysimachos was killed in 281 BC, and this ship, and the rest of his fleet, passed to Ptolemy Coranos, and it was used the next year in a naval battle fought between him and Antigonus II 
but after that, the ship evidently proved too unwieldy, and it seems to have been retired. Our last Hellenistic mega weapon is also a mobile siege platform, something of a cross between the Helepolis and the Leontophoros, designed to approach city walls from the sea and enable marines to assault the fortifications. This is the Sambuca, a Roman innovation that, actually, was used successfully, but apparently, while taking heavy losses. During the siege of Syracuse in 213 BC, Roman forces led by Marcus Claudius Marcellus and Appius Claudius Pulcher assaulted the city by both land and sea. The city, famously, was able to draw on one of the greatest minds of the ancient world, the mathematician and inventor Archimedes, who devised an ingenious weapon, the Claw of Archimedes, that apparently was able to grapple Roman ships and render them useless. Ultimately, though, the Romans were eventually successful in storming the battlements and they took the city, and they did this in no small part thanks to the Sambuca. According to Polybius, the Romans had eight ships joined together in pairs by a deck. On this deck was a siege ladder, named after the Sambuca because when it was fully extended, the whole thing resembled that instrument. It was lowered toward enemy fortifications by a system of ropes and pulleys, and had guard rails on each side as well as grappling hooks and a landing platform, enabling it to anchor to the wall once contact was made. The Romans deployed four of these siege engines during the battle, enabling marines to scale the harbor walls. In doing so, however, they took heavy casualties. The Romans apparently did not employ catapults or bolt throwers on their ships, in contrast to the other navies of the Hellenistic era, but the Syracusans had those engines mounted on the harbor wall. With only archers on their ships, the Romans had to approach the city under heavy artillery fire, and in one instance, attempting to deploy the Sambuca actually did not work. It was only after this siege, when Romans captured large stocks of artillery and the engineers trained in their use, that they began to put said artillery on their own ships. These mega weapons and super ships continued to play a role in Hellenistic warfare up until the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, when large numbers of these ships, although none as big as the Leontophoros or the Tesserocanteres, duked it out in the Aegean. Octavian's victory on September 2nd marked the end of the Hellenistic mega weapons and super ships, when Roman hegemony marked the start of a new era, and the giant weapons which the Hellenistic kings had built faded into the past relics of a bygone age.